and welcome to Four Wheels Good, the only weekly motoring programme to run right the way throughout the year. Well, this week, Mike Rutherford drives the new BMW 5 Series Touring in Scotland and finds out how many bizarre items he can fit in the back. We'll also find out the best way to clean your car. And we reveal the UK price of the amazing Dodge Viper Coupe we drove not too long ago. First, though, in recent weeks we've celebrated the launches of new and exciting cars. Motoring can be very enjoyable, as we all know, and we can be proud of the design and engineering achievements car manufacturers have brought about. But there is a downside to motoring, not just congestion and clogged roads, but roads which, through lack of forethought or downright incompetence, are extremely dangerous. Mike Rutherford reports. I have with me today Ted Clements, who's the road safety advisor for the Institute of Advanced Motorists, the former chief examiner of the IAM and a former police officer, in fact. Ted, this is one of the most dangerous roads in Britain, the gateway to Europe, the A2, and I think this must be surely the most dangerous slip road in Britain. Well, this is absolutely ridiculous. You're coming out of a filling station here onto a busy road, which is motorway standards. I know it's an A-class road, but there's no sort of slip road access point whatsoever to get on the road. Look at the car here, it's having difficulty. What it really means is that you've got to come out there and effectively just do a left turn onto a motorway type road. That's right. Here's an occasion where you should, and I would, use the hard shoulder to get up a little speed, bit of speed to join the carriageway. Here he's got to cutting the traffic almost in half. He even has the space to drive up that hard shoulder, no problem at all. Look at him, he could be sitting there all day. That's right. Yes, he's treating it more or less like a stop sign. And if you use the hard shoulder, a little bit, not much. And I think this is where the engineer or engineers could improve the, the uh, hard shoulder by making a much, a little bit of a slip road. Well, now he's got a one way, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, this is, an, uh, this is an accident waiting to happen. This is a fatality waiting to happen, isn't it? Because the road users on the main road, thinking they're on a motorway, they're not expecting people to suddenly come out at right angles onto them. We should also explain that this road is only, what, less than an hour from Dover, and it's a, it's a pretty steep incline coming down. They're coming down here at at least 70, and it is a 70 mile an hour yeah. road, and justifiably yeah. so. There are people who are not familiar with the roads of Britain, perhaps, because they're tourists over to, to the UK for the first time, and they come across this disaster. I mean, in road safety terms, how bad is this, Ted? I think it's very, very bad indeed. And I think the highway engineer should get in, in liaison with the, local, the uh, police and other uh, interested bodies and try and improve it. I don't think it's a fault of the garage here, and I'm not mentioning the name of the garage for obvious reasons, but I think it's perhaps a joint exercise that they could do something, either delete the hard shoulder and make a, a short section of, of slip road, because people are coming over here from the continent completely foreign in more ways than one to this driving on these sort of conditions. I think it's only a matter of time, isn't it, before there's a, a major accident it here? Quite likely will be, and I, I'm, I'm not too familiar with this particular area, but I think it's more than likely that there has been one or two fatal accidents here. Well, Ted, this says it all. Busy road, lots of traffic, trucks, cars, a 40 mile an hour of sign outside what is a, a school for instant infants. It's crazy, isn't it? Well, it's ridiculous. I think this is an area where we should have a 20 mile an hour limit. I mean, it's most important. People will still drive at 30, but I think a 20 mile an hour limit would be ideal on this particular type of road. And let's get this clear, the government has given the OK to local authorities to introduce 20 mile an hour schemes. Well, but they don't make full use of this sort of thing and I think more use could be made, more liaison with the local police as well. Yeah, and this sign, as we can see, is brand new. I, I actually yeah. kn I remember this sign being erected yeah. a few months yeah. ago. So it's not like it's an archaic sign that's been there for a decade. They've decided in the 90s to put up a 40 mile an hour sign outside a school that has a playground and there are young kids yes, around. Well, all speed limits should be reviewed completely, not from the bottom end, but the top end as well. And I think this particular limit here outside of school is absolutely ridiculous. Let's go and see if we can find any more. Well, this is, now let's see if this truck can go around here at 40 miles an hour. He's going around at more like 20 and it's physically impossible for him to get round on his side of the road. But the law says he can go around there at 40 miles an hour and what's more, the truck going the other way can do 40 miles an hour as well. Now if you think we're making a lot of fuss about nothing, look no further than this. This is a wreath that was sadly put here a little while ago following a fatal accident 
A young girl came down here late one evening, got a couple of friends in the car. This is a 60 mile an hour road. She was probably doing 60, like, the, like all of us from time to time, doing a bit more than the legal speed limit, maybe 70 miles an hour. And this is the result. She drove into this bank, she died. This is because the speed limit is entirely wrong. If that can happen to her, it can happen to others. And of course, a year or two on, the local authorities still haven't changed the sign. It's still a 60 limit. It's still too fast. And while we're on the subject of 60 limits, look at this pavement. It's just, it's just about wide enough for a person and their dog to be walking along. And they're inches away from traffic that's doing 60. Madness. Not only madness, but lethal madness, as we can see from this. I'm driving now down a 30 mile an hour street and uh, I'm doing something nearer 15, 20 miles an hour, as I always do. When I came around this bend a couple of years ago, just at this point here, when I was doing about 20 here, a kid came at me on the wrong side yeah. of the road. The kid was on his brother's bike, yeah. he didn't know the rules of the road. I was doing 15, 20, as I always do, because this is a road I use regularly. If I'd have been doing 30, I swear to God that kid would have been killed. We collided, not because my car hit him, but because his bike hit my stationary car. And surely, this is the classic case of a 30 mile an hour road that should be a 20 mile an hour road. Again, yeah. if you try and drive around this bend at 30 miles an hour, it's physically quite difficult to do it. You've got to drive more like a, not quite a racing driver, mm -hmm. but you know what I mean. Yes, I 20 know. is yeah. much yeah. more comfortable. Yeah. And if I'd have been doing 30 instead of 20 that day, I reckon that kid would yeah, have been yeah. injured, if not dead. Thankfully, there was a witness that saw I was driving very slowly, confirmed that the kid rode into me and me not into the kid. The fact that I was on the right side of the road and he was on the wrong side of the road. But I'll tell you, when I met the kid's old man that night, I wasn't sure if I was going to get a punch on the face or, yeah, uh, or a bottle well of scotch. Yeah, um, yeah. But fortunately, he was a very understanding father and he thanked me for driving at that yeah. low speed. So, yet again, 30 mile an hour road. Surely, Ted, this should be a 20 this mile an hour. Definitely road. a 20 miles an hour stretch here. It's a very tight bend. Most people will always drive far, far too fast for the conditions, but 20 miles an hour is the limit in this particular situation here. And correct me if I'm wrong, but again, hasn't the government said that at 20 miles an hour, God forbid that if you do collide with a kid, the kid stands a chance. At 30 or 40 miles an hour, yes. the kid's usually dead. It's an excellent slogan that the Department of Transport uses. Remember me when I am gone away gone far away into the silent land when you can no more hold me by the hand nor I half turn to go yet turning stay remember me when no more day by day you tell me of our future that you planned This is a lovely road to drive on, Ted. It's a nice winding country road, lots of nice scenery. Yeah. 60 miles an hour, lots of houses here, people walking dogs, quite a narrow footpath there. Do you think 60 is maybe a bit too quick for a this one? A little bit on the fast side, 60 here, but bearing in mind that we've got the leaves missing from the trees, so yeah. vision is better than it is during the summer months. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's still rather fast where you've got a lot of um, yeah. built up area, houses and kiddies crossing the road. Now, this is interesting because we've got a sign here saying there's a nasty bend coming up. Yep. We've got a thing that says slow, we've got an arrow turning us in, but it's still 60, isn't it? It's still 60 miles an hour until you hear signs or see signs to the contrary. This right. is the speed that you're entitled legally to do. Now that, I felt very uneasy about going through there. I was going through at 40 and I, that seemed to me just about right. We've got a farm here which in the summer is a farm shop, which means people are coming and going, but still we're 60 miles an hour. Here we've got good driving condition, we've got good vision, good visibility, road surface dry, that's fine. But don't forget you'll be coming along here late at night or when it's wet and greasy, a lot of leaves on the road, that's when it can be dangerous. Now we're coming into our 30 miles an hour sign, ease off on the gas and as you come into 30 miles an hour that's what the speed you should be doing. Maybe a little touch on my brakes there just to warn the guy behind me? Excellent idea, it certainly wakes up chummy behind you. And then we've got to, immediately we've got a school there. We've got what looks like old people's homes here because I think, yes, I think these are local authority homes for the elderly. Mm -hmm. We've got another school here and we've got, um, what's this, looks like a parade of shops up there. So that 30 mile an hour limit, well, 
again, that could have maybe dropped down to 20, couldn't yes, it, considering it could. those circumstances? It could quite easily. You're close to schools and built up area, a lot of shops and what have you, coming up to a busy road junction here. Now, as we just said, this is the scene of a very recent fatal accident. You can just see how it happened. A girl was driving down here with a couple of friends in the car with her. It's a 60 mile an hour road. Can you believe this? 60 miles an hour, virtually the same speed that you do on a motorway. She came round this bend, it was at night, didn't see the bend coming up, and bang, straight in there, dead. Now, I'm sorry if that's upsetting, and I'm sorry if it's not the sort of television that you expected or you wanted, but that's what happens when you've got these absurd speed limits. That is never a 60 mile an hour road. The kid dies, her friends are injured, her parents are distraught, and their life has been turned upside down, and yet the local authority does nothing about the problem. It's still a 60 mile an hour road. We're coming along here, it's, it's 60 along here still, as we speak. You know, there are houses along here, you know, I can't help thinking that maybe 40 or 50, perhaps 50, is more appropriate. Certainly not 60, but this is the real, the one that gets me. We're driving up here, I'm only doing 50, that's, that's quick enough, believe me. Suddenly, we go from 60 into 30. Now, apart from anything, it's impossible, almost, unless you do an emergency stop, to go down from 60 to 30. But look, 30 across here, there's a guy on the wrong side of the road. The reason he's on the wrong side of the road is because it's so narrow. This bridge has been bashed countless times because that is never a 30 mile an hour road, a 30 mile an hour bridge. That's a 20 mile an hour caution, very narrow bridge road. And that's why that bridge is always getting clonked and that's why people are always bashing up their cars and bashing up themselves because the speed limit is wrong and you could say well it's only a guideline people have to make decisions for themselves well that's as may be but it seems to me that if you've got a sign that says 60 or 30 it's no wonder that people are driving up to and slightly beyond those limits and you've got to bring them down in certain cases now you hear lots of noise too much noise i think from people who say they don't want bypasses but here's living proof that bypasses are needed they are wanted and they improve road safety and, and what better evidence than here? We have here a road that's just opened within the last few months. I think it's doing a brilliant job, Ted. Well, I think it is and it proves the point that the bridge behind us is very narrow, but all this traffic came over this particular bridge and a bypass is very, very important indeed. Yeah, I mean, just look at this bridge. Up until a few months ago, these container lorries were hacking over that bridge, two-way traffic trying to pass each other. In fact, they physically couldn't squeeze through two at a time. You didn't have any residents here complaining about bypasses. You didn't have any residents here tunnelling into the ground saying, protect us, we don't want any new roads. You had residents in this area, and rightfully so, saying, we need this bypass, and I think they mirror residents all over Britain. Well, I think this particular road is one of the most dangerous roads I've been through, if not the most dangerous, I think. And I think it's important that people should exercise a little bit more care, but I think road planners should get their act together. And there's a container port right behind us, which all this traffic is thundering down there when they could have had a, a dual carriageway or a motorway and at the end of it. Well, isn't that the point? We've got a container port at, at, at what was originally the end of a country lane. What on earth are we doing citing container ports in places like that Surely we should stick the container ports in places like Dover where the, where the motorway practically goes to the door. Well, I think the sign behind us says it all, doesn't it? A289, the nightmare on the A289. These are local residents who I think with some justification are complaining that they don't like 18,000 vehicles going through here every day. Many, many of them being container lorries with yep. huge uh, loads on the back, Ted. I mean, just how bad do you think this road is? Well, m many people may think the residents here are NIMBYs, not in my backyard, but I think this is an area where a bypass is long overdue. It's got a big container depot at the end of this road, and it is, without any shadow of doubt, one of the most dangerous roads I've been in for many a day. And it is, effectively, a country lane. It was built as a residential street. It was not built to take heavy lorries. Well, a horse and cart coming down the, this particular road wouldn't look out of place at all, but these large container vehicles, I sympathise with the drivers and all the problems that yep. they have to put up with, but so do the residents, and they are dangerous roads, and, and, and it puts many youngsters in danger. In the space of one wet and windy afternoon, Ted Clements from the IAM and myself have gone out and we found roads that have got speed limits that are too high, roads with speed limits that are too low, which means one obvious thing, that we need a national speed limit review in Britain. 
We've also seen roads where they should have bypasses that they don't have bypasses. We've seen trucks driving along roads that whether you're a pro-trucker, anti-trucker, anti-roads person, pro-roads person, those trucks should not be thundering past people's bedrooms at three o'clock in the morning. We've seen over the road from here, probably the most dangerous slip road in Britain where people are going to be killed if they haven't been killed already. And if we can find those things in just one afternoon by going out and just looking around the streets of southern England, imagine what the transport planners, the Department of Transport officials, the police and others can find. There's an election coming up, and it's very simple, it seems to me. If somebody actually just puts in their manifesto that they're going to look at measures like this, that they're going to improve speed limits, that they're going to improve road junctions in Britain, that they're going to look at the bypasses and introduce bypasses where they're needed, where they're really needed by the residents, then it's a vote winner. They can't see the wood for the trees. And you maybe thought our oh, motormouth Rutherford was just an uncaring flash freeloader. Well, Mike, in fact, is very involved with various campaigns around the country to bring the injury and death toll down. And in future weeks, we'll be hearing more about these. On to happier things now, and if you remember, Ginny Buckley uh, enthusing about the awesome Dodge Viper at the Paul Ricard circuit some months ago. She was saying it would be about now when the UK price would be announced. Peter Baker has the details you need. The UK price of this awesome 8-litre Chrysler Viper GTS Coupe, which goes on sale in this country next month, has just been announced. And it's a price that could please you and your bank manager. That's because the first Viper GTS Coupes will have an on-the-road price of only £68,800. They may think that's a lot, but it's actually considerably less than some pundits had been predicting. Just 15 of the 177 mile an hour American built coupes will be made available this year. Already, apparently, 11 of those have already been ordered. Combining the raw power and excitement of the dramatic Viper Roadster with the sophistication of an air conditioned coupe, the new Viper GTS will be available in two colors take it or leave it. Yep, it's only in the familiar metallic blue with double white stripes running from the front to the rear of the car. The GTS Coupe is more than just a Viper Roadster with a roof. The V10 engine has been lightened and extensively modified. The 8-litre all-aluminium 10-cylinder engine pushes the Viper GTS from rest to 60 in under 4.5 seconds. Despite the extra bodywork and greater glass area, the Viper GTS is actually 60 pounds lighter than the Roadster. They've done this by adopting lighter weight aluminium suspension and lighter seats. Rigidity is up 12% over the Roadster and aerodynamics have been drastically improved. The coefficient of drag is down to 0.39 in the GTS from the Roadster's 0.5. Luxury features missing from the Back to Basics Roadster are now included on the GTS such as air conditioning and electric windows. First seen as a design study at the Detroit Motor Show back in 93, the GTS project was given the go-ahead in May of that year and 34 months later the first production car rolled off the legendary Connor assembly plant production line in Detroit and now at last we can buy it here in the UK. Start saving. You could be driving this Chrysler Viper GTS Coupe for £68,800. Mm, yes, it's a powerful beast and you have to be a, a special kind of person to be able to tame such power. Well, if the huge Viper is a little out of your league, then I'm sure drag racing would be completely out of the question. Unless that is your like a spunky American lady called Shelley Anderson. Top Fuel Drag Racing in America, presented by the National Hot Rod Association, is a uniquely American sport with the fastest dedicated race cars in the world. A quarter mile, zero to 300 miles an hour, in just under five seconds, and Shelly Anderson is the driver who's at the top of the game. What does it feel like to drive the car? What is the acceleration like, and uh, do you think you'd ever get tired of it? You'll never get tired of it. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's like sitting there and a bowling ball hits you in the chest as soon as you hit the throttle. Makes over just over 6,000 horsepower. Goes zero to 100 in under one second. Pulls five and a half Gs, which is more than the space shuttle. Burns 13 gallons of nitro on a quarter of a mile run. How much does it cost you to make a, a run, a test run, or even a race run? Um, 
a quarter of a mile run costs us $5,000. Whether I go 20 feet or full length of the track, we put a new clutch pack in it, the heads come off, the pistons come out, they check the mains, a new blower. I mean, everything's new when we go back up there. So you essentially disassemble and rebuild the engine every time? Every time, no matter what, we have 90 minutes. That is also to rewarm it up and reset, take the valve covers back off, reset the valves, and get it all ready 90 minutes. Shelly, your dad, Brad Anderson, has been in uh, drag racing for many years as a racer and as a cylinder head builder. Tell us what, what parts he makes and supplies to other racers. He makes cylinder heads, manifold rockers, assembly valve covers, uh, wrist pin, pin buttons. Uh, he's got some of the best in racing, John Force, uh, Don Perdome, Al Hoffman. So it's kind of nice to be able to say, you know, you've got such good customers and they are, they're really good to us. Had your father raced in his past, or was he strictly an engine builder? Three-time world champion, alcohol funny car. I worked on his engines, and Dad made me go to college and graduate before I ever drove. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to find something else to do. I was fine working on engines, but he didn't want me to drive. Talking about women in drag racing, is there something about drag racing people and drag racing culture that's made it easier for women to get involved as drivers? No, I don't know. I, I've seen women come and go in drag racing. I think if you come because you're a girl to drag racing, girls come and go. Yeah. If you come because you're a racer, there's room for you. Shelly, you had that bad crash at Pomona. Did that slow you down at all after the crash? That was no big deal, actually. We won the race, we got the points, and the rest, who cared? I mean, we were just so happy to uh, win the race. Um, first race of the year, come out on a, with a win, and it was exciting. And the crash, actually, um, and the fire was better for my sponsors. They got more uh, newspaper time, more TV time, and it worked out great. Now, I noticed there's a beautiful red Corvette in, yes. in the shop. But that's your dad's car. He says he doesn't let you drive that car. Um, my dad doesn't let me drive any of his cars. I've crashed through my dad's cars, mom and dad's cars, um, in head-on car crashes. One was a drunk driver. Um, one jumped over the center divider and landed on me when I was doing running for my dad's business. That one hurt. Yeah. That one I had a couple of surgeries from. Um, and then I had a third one when I finally got to go back to work. Mm -hmm. Going down the road, truck coming this way, no other cars around. And when he got in front of me, he turned right in front of me. And they've all been other people's faults, but Dad's not real happy. <laughs> Now it's time to join our resident international freeloader on another car launch jaunt. Mike Rutherford took up BMW's invitation to fly to Scotland to drive the new touring version of the BMW 5 Series. It may have been wet, but it didn't dampen Mike's enthusiasm for the flexibility of the new vehicle. Well, you couldn't have missed last year's saloon of the year, really. I think the 5 Series BMW, which was unveiled in 1996, arguably my car of the year, had gone one better. 
after the 5 Series Saloon, they've launched the touring version. They don't call this an estate because estate cars are those grubby things for taking rubbish down to the municipal tipping. A, a BMW 5 Series estate is called the 5 Series Touring. You don't put uh, rubbish in the back, you put your golf clubs in the back. Or occasionally you might put a little bit of shopping in the back when you go to one of those upmarket supermarkets. Now, it's interesting design. Of course it's got the conventional boot release so that you can just uh, lift it like that but in case you've just got a couple of uh, carrier bags and you need to plonk them in the back probably Harrods bags actually just a little flick of that switch and uh, in they go you've got here a cover to uh, hide any um, any valuables you've got in the boot you've also got beneath the floor a lockable compartment which means you can put some small valuables uh, sort of in with the spare wheel and in theory nobody would ever know about it but I've just told them where to look now haven't I silly me You'll like this, I promise you. How about this? Oh look, they think of everything. Look, not only is there a, an extended load carrying area for putting loads on and then sliding them in if they're awkward or even for putting your kids on if you're having a picnic or the kids are trying to get off their muddy boots or something like that. Uh, but attention to detail, I think we call that. Look, we didn't know that was there. Um, but I, I really do worry, this only takes 75 kilos and that means that a fat like me couldn't sit on it so I'm not sure that that's a great idea and it costs all adds to the cost and talking of cost the new 5 series BMW Touring goes on sale in April it will cost of the order of 25,000 pounds about 25,300 pounds for the 2 litre version but get this it goes up to about 45,000 for the 4 litre uh, 540i to put that in context, you could have this car plus a very nice 3 Series saloon or come to that, uh, a, probably a bottom of the range 5 Series saloon for the price of just one 540i Touring. I can't really see, although the 540 is, is better equipped in, in every department virtually, I can't see how a car that shares the same body shell as another one can be 19, 20,000 pounds more expensive. But uh, it has to be said that with that 540i you get a lot for your money. You also get a lot for your money with the uh, with the bottom of the range 520 I should add. In fact they, BMW reckoned that there's only a sort of 1900, 2000 pounds price premium over the saloon version so that's what you're paying uh, for the equivalent uh, estate or as they prefer to call it touring. Now the other one, and this one, would you pay £25,350 for this car? <laughs> it doesn't like it. What is it?
We're joined by an old friend of the programme, Chris Willows from BMW GB. Chris, who's going to buy this sort of car? Well, judging by the people who previously bought the 5 Series Touring, they're executive um, managers of companies. They're a lot of them company owners. Almost 50% of people who actually own or have a serious stake in a company. And, of course, family people. I mean... This is a more flexible uh, saloon car, in effect, rather than an estate. That's the way we, we put it across, mm. and, and that's why the previous one was bought. So it, it's family people, but family people who have a degree of success or can control their own lifestyles. And a degree of money in the bank as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Absolutely. And talk us through, through the range. It starts with the 520i, which I think comes in at about... Uh, 25, 350, something that's like right, that. That's right. And uh, what other versions are well, there? Well, the, the, the two litre one, 520, comes in May. The, it's first of all the 528 and the 525 TDS diesel. The 520 is the range starter, if you like, at mm -hmm. the price you've mentioned, 25, 350. Um, that will be followed by the 523, which confusingly has a 2.5 litre engine yep. in it, the 528, which is this car here, then the 525 TDS. Um, that's the, the diesel intercooled turbocharged version and topping out the range is a, a large 4.4 litre 8 cylinder engine car the 540i Touring mm. now that comes in from memory at about 45 grand yeah, just under huge price difference I mean you're getting the same body shell but you're paying £20,000 more for the car now alright you're getting a bigger engine but uh, it seems an awful huge well, you're getting price more, disparity you're getting more than double the size of engine Mike for yeah. it but, yeah. but yeah, does that count for 20 grand of course part of it is the engine it's an, mm. it's an 8 cylinder engine it's produced in very much smaller quantities mm. and the engine is much more expensive to produce mm. but it's not just the engine it's the equipment that you get with the car as mm. well mm. Um, that car comes as standard with air conditioning and all sorts of um, mm. Of, of creature comforts, if you like, that make it a, the, the sort of car you would expect at, at £45,000. But it is true to say you could actually buy a bottom of the range 5 Series Touring and a 1.9 litre Z3 yes. uh, for the same price yes. as one top of the range Touring. I can see the direction you're coming from, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> I think it's worth having a closer look at this rear Talgo because it's, it's this soft touch device. There's no leverage goes on here, just a gentle touch. You may have heard that. And it lifts up. And similarly, when you close it, there's no slamming, just a gentle drop down of the hatch and it kind of shuts electronically. This uh, extended load carrying area, I'm not quite so sure about it. It extends about two foot. It will take, like I said, 75 kilos, which means that Somebody like me, it's probably a little bit too heavy for. But the idea is that if you've got a couple of kids, maybe we'll find a couple of kids later to demonstrate the point, you can have them sitting here, maybe uh, peeling off their muddy boots or, uh, I don't know, having a picnic watching the point-to-point -point or something like that. But like I said, this is not an estate car. This is a touring. And uh, it doesn't do grubby things like go down to the municipal tip. It carries um, hampers and Harrods bags and golf clubs and that sort of thing. test drive we've grabbed a 528i SE which stands for special equipment 
And you would think, wouldn't you, from that uh, badging that this car, and particularly its price tag of £32,505, would be a car that would be very well equipped, as indeed it is. But in fact, the version we're in right now actually has, believe it or not, £10,500 worth of extras on top of that. So we're in a sort of £42,000, £43,000 version. What do all those uh, extras include? Well, for starters, you've got these... Uh, what are called comfort memory seats, which means that uh, you can set the position every time you climb back in the car after somebody else has driven it, the seat will go back to the position that uh, personally favours you. There's also the onboard navigation system, which is probably the, the most advanced of its type. That's another £4,000, something of that order. We've got metallic paint, one or two other things, ten and a half grand's worth of extras on this particular car. I mean, my advice for people would be Go for the basic car. By just, ironically, we don't have a sunroof, funnily enough, but you know, I think a sunroof is not a bad idea. This car's got a very expensive CD system. Avoid CDs, just stick with a cassette player and a radio. And uh, really ask yourself if you're gonna get anything back on all those extras you're investing in. You know, it's a bit like having an expensive kitchen fitted in the house. When you come to sell that house, you ain't gonna get the money back on the, what you spent on that fitted kitchen. And the same rule applies with cars, really. Spend several thousand pounds on extras. When you come to sell the car, you won't get a great deal more for it. Certainly, you won't get your money, your, your, your money back. I mean, as you'd expect from a, a quality car like a BMW, driving this is the absolute. But well, for me, it's. I can't think of too many cars I'd rather be driving cross country. You remember a few weeks ago we looked at the uh, the saloon version, and I was raving then about its driving qualities, its refinement, its, I don't know if you can get a sense of that acceleration, but you know, absolutely nothing lacking in performance terms. And in terms of comfort and feeling at one with the car, I mean, you, you just cannot go wrong. I don't quite know how BMW do it, but you kind of snuggle in, you get behind the wheel, and you, you, you instantly feel confident immediately this sort of vehicle inspires you and makes you want to drive you know it's a corny old thing to say they call it the ultimate driving machine and you know in terms of saloon cars and estate cars sorry touring cars um, then really I think they they have very very few competitors if any at all the days when Mercedes gave BMW a run for their money I think are over Yep, it's a beautiful looking car, but it's no good having the wheels if you haven't the know-how to find out where you're going in an unfamiliar place. After the break, we'll be testing out different types of navigation systems, and not all are fancy electronic ones either. Hi, welcome back to Four Wheels Good here on Granada Men and Motors. Now, just how more efficient are the new fancy electronic navigation systems that are around? Surely there's no real substitute for a man with some nous and a good honest road map. Well, we found some willing volunteers and put them to a fascinating test. When you last set off on a car journey you'd never made before, how did you find the way? Use a map, ask someone, or invest in a major piece of computer technology with automatic satellite updates? To test out all three, I've come to Accrington, which fortunately I found very easily. And I've got three sets of volunteers who are going to drive to a secret location using different methods, but which will be the most effective? Using a good old fashioned paper map, the Ordnance Survey Northern England edition, or asking someone the way. In this case, the computer program Autoroute Express, which prints out in advance a list of directions on paper or Personal Navigator, a satellite system that updates an in-car laptop computer to show your location on screen at any time. My volunteers are chip shop owners from here in Accrington. Andreas and Andreas, that's easy to remember. Are you ready to go? Well, I am, but I'm worried about my navigator. Why? I've never read a map before. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, there is your map and everything else you need. Good luck, safe driving. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Gary and Janet, I've got a little envelope here for you. How do you feel about this journey? Fine. Yeah. You're looking forward to it? I'd be better yeah. if I had, had a computer. <laughs> well, you've not got the computer, you've got auto route. I know. All the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Barry, you've got a high-tech personal navigator in your laptop and John to help you organise it. There's your envelope, but don't open it yet. 
Right, you don't know where you're going, but all I can tell you is there's a slap-up lunch waiting for you when you get there. If they get there. I'm off now, you wait ten minutes and then follow me. Uh, and no cheating, we've got a camera in every car. Hotel. New Brighton. Merseyside, right. Point for Macrington, Lancashire, on the A679, five miles west. So it's towards Burnley. Towards Burnley? Yeah. Head for Liverpool. And worry about it then. Right. So, so do you know where you're going? No, no, no. no let me have leave it. map open then. Leave map open. So we go for the quickest route, shall we? Yeah, why not? That uh, symbol in the middle of the screen represents our position. Um, and the positional information is derived from this satellite receiver here. From those satellites, we're able to, or well, the receiver is able to calculate its position accurate to 50 metres anywhere in the world. We basically Once, know the, the way that we're going. We're heading for Liverpool Way. We're heading for Liverpool. Down the M62, anyway. Once we go down the M62 to Liverpool, then we can worry then. Any time I've been to Liverpool, we went for the passports. So we've got at least another hour just to do nothing except drive. Show me the way to go. Well, if you're interested, we're at an altitude of 462 feet above sea level. We're travelling at 49 miles per hour, and we're two and a half miles from the junction of the M6, where we want to turn left and head south. Six A677. Yeah, that's the one. We're back at Bloody Blackburn again. Oh, gee whiz. So we've just drove for half an hour for nothing, and then we're back at the beginning again. We don't go this way. We do. So we've got to follow Paddyham? Yeah. Where's Paddyham? Oh, yeah. For God's sake, Gary. Well, you're the one that's been supposed to be navigating, aren't you? Saying, right, turn left. New Brighton, eh? The A554, so yeah. keep that in mind. Ferry across the breezy. What's your signal doing? Well, we've lost all satellites. <laughs> Help! This way, oh no. No? I don't bloody know now. You're supposed to be watching for me. Well, it's pointless just bloody turning off. Huh? Excuse me, mate. Do you know where Victoria Road is? There we go. New Brighton, according to this, is uh, straight ahead. Just go that way. I can't go that way. It's not going away. If, if we, we could be going that way, we could be going that way. You're better off going asking at that garage there. And so it's on that side then? 157. We're going to see it then, it must be along here somewhere. You are first, you are. Here, well done, you did very well. But Liverpool's that way, I mean, huh? Well, this is little 582. Are we after this one? No, it's not on. Eh? Huh? It's not on, are you? Holland's Hay Hotel, here we go, on the left. And the boys are here. Oh, we're visiting parts that we've never seen before. <laughs> We'd not Hi. bloody find it again if we tried. Uh, well, would we? No, I don't think you would. That's why a navigator should be sat there, isn't it? 
you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What kind of problems did you encounter? The only problem we encountered was when we came out of the tunnel, wasn't it? We missed the turning. It was so easy, it was a bit boring, really. I mean, was... <laughs> the two Andreases, one hour and 15 minutes, which was quite impressive, using the old-fashioned map-reading method. And this is your first time to New Brighton? It is, yeah. Yeah, apart from his aunt to live in next door, but one. Yeah. Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> Here they are. Come on in. <laughs> a bit later than everybody. But what do you think of... Of Auto Route Express. I don't like that way, like journey. Now I can't we could have follow. Done with your map. I think we took wrong road when we when uh, so as soon as we took out of Accrington. <laughs> Janet, you don't look happy. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were blaming me all the way there. <laughs> that was stressful, I'm telling you. Well, just to cheer you up and relieve the stress, we've ordered you fish and chips for lunch. <laughs> I thought you said you were going to give me £100 then. <laughs> <laughs> You're here safe trouble. and sound. We've ordered you lunch. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> a nice glass of. Uh, Water, I think. Water. <laughs> <laughs> just, just interesting experiment there, Eamon. Now, when I always get lost is when hotels in areas you've never driven to before fax you a uh, simplified, block-drawn, out-of-scale, topological map of how to find them, which bears no resemblance of the actual area and often doesn't even include road numbers. Pathetic. Well, that's all we've time for this week. Ginny, Mike, Eamon and Nicky will be back again next week, and so will I. So please join us then for another edition of Four Wheels Good. Bye-bye.